All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Christopher Mary, and I am from SolidCAD. Um, hopefully you've been able to enjoy yourself uh, a little bit during this difficult time with uh, some other webinars. But um, what we're gonna do today is just kind of focus on uh, the feature cam surface milling side. Just a quick introduction to um, surface cam, or sorry, uh, feature cam surface milling. Um, the reason why I picked this topic is uh, mainly on requests that we had through some other uh, webinars. So I was hoping to have uh, Mr. Christopher Crane from Autodesk join us on this, uh, this call today, but uh, it looks like he's tied up, so I'll be flying solo. So that being said, uh, I know some of you um, are feature cam users. Um, we also have some feature cam slash power mill users. So, and we also have some people on the call that uh, may never have seen feature cam at all. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just kind of step into the initial depths of feature cam and what it provides. So it's, uh, it's an automated type software out of the box. Uh, so if those of you have used feature cam, um, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of get going when you install the software because feature cam gives you most everything you need to get started. So on the initial install, to generating some code, you know, it's not uh, it's not a long workflow. But the users that have uh, got more power mill experience, uh, definitely power mill. There's a little bit more work to be done uh, to get from ground zero to uh, your ultimate goals to produce some some good NC toolpaths. So what's the difference between uh, feature cam and say power mill? Well. Feature cam is feature-based technology. Um, the best way I can describe that is if there's a hole or a pocket, as we can see here on the screen, that um, feature cam will do its best to extract that feature and it will apply operations to that feature. So if, if we have a pocket that uh, feature cam extracts from the model, it will automatically apply maybe a roughing, even maybe a semi-finish or a finishing operation automatically to it. And it's going to look at the tools we have available to itself too and extract the uh, the appropriate tools for us looking at our tools crib so that's where the uh the automation process comes in so just a, another recap of what i just mentioned you know we can import or draw our geometry uh it will identify the features we simulate to generate our nc code that's pretty quick so again, for those of you who have not seen feature cam, what I'm gonna do is just kind of step into a quick AFR demonstration, just to kind of show you uh, basically the bread and butter of what feature cam does. So let me just escape out of this, jump back into feature cam. And for this example, I'm using feature cam 2021, which was just uh, released a couple weeks ago. So let me minimize everything we have here. Uh, give me one second here, I'm gonna to have to Let's open up feature cam again. And let's look to my desktop and I'm gonna grab a file there. Okay, so let me just grab this simple part. Okay, so we're just gonna import this uh, simple bracket into feature cam. And when feature cam recognizes some kind of import, it always opens up this import results wizard. It's up to me if I wanna exit out or continue on with this wizard. I normally always do, um, just to initialize the setup. So it's asked me to pick my Z direction so let's pick off of a horizontal face. So I'll pick this top face here and recognize that the Z is going in the opposite direction. It's most likely from the CAD file from uh, the CAD system. So sometimes the Z axis will kind of flip around its orientation, but we can reverse it. And we're gonna define the X axis using kind of the same method. Let's go ahead and compute our stock. So I'm gonna use it from the minimum size of the part. Let's bring this back to zero. Uh, maybe this is already a um, 
part already decides all we're doing is drilling and putting these slots in. And we need to pick up our orientation or our setup location. So I'll put it on the lower left. And no multi-axis, so we're gonna hit finish. So I could have incorporated another checkbox to automatically go into what we call feature recognition. But um, I'm gonna do it a little bit more manually this time. I'm gonna go up into the part program group, click on AFR, and we need to have a solid for this, which uh, FeatureCam recognizes as a solid. And I'm gonna hit finish, and it's gonna pluck all of the features like I mentioned in the previous slide, all the operations, all the tools. All we need to really do is hit simulate and we can generate our NC code. So it's it's really that quick if, especially if we have these one-off parts, because maybe we just wanna throw this up, get some code going so we can concentrate on maybe another machine center. So we're not too worried about um, saving any bit of time. We can also run a 3D SIM to verify if there are any gouges or collisions. Okay, so everything looks good so far. I don't see any pauses. So I'm pretty satisfied with uh, what we got here. So I can save this, send it out to the machine center. And like I said, uh, continue on either programming my next part or uh, getting my next uh, machine up and running. Okay, so let me just go ahead and close that. Again, that's pretty simple. I'm sure it's uh, not every day we encounter a part that simple, but that's what uh, Feature Game does for us. All right, so uh, just to kind of, um, before we go any further, I wanna keep this webinar pretty interactive. Um, so if something pops up, feel free to unmute yourself, go ahead and ask a question. Uh, there's the chat bar there as well. So you can open up the chat, ask a question. I'm by myself, I'll do my best to monitor it, but um, feel free, uh, interrupt me at any time. Okay, we're gonna keep this a uh, little loose today. All right, so let me just go ahead and jump back into that uh, PowerPoint presentation. And let's go on to the next slide. And let me just go ahead and uh, flip this around. I'm running two monitors here, so I'll just leave it the way it is. Okay, so feature cam, we can run a large variety of different types of machine centers. Uh, anything from your milling center, two axis, all the way up to five axis to our multitasking turn centers, which are a little bit more complex to, to manage and operate. Um, probing, as well as our production type documents for tombstone and multi-fixture. Okay, but uh, within this milling section, we fall into a different category when it comes to surface milling or surface uh, features. And that's kind of what we're gonna focus uh, on the rest of this webinar. So surface milling. Uh, when something is not a your standard feature, you know, a pocket, a slot, a boss, this is when we can tap into the other side of feature cam. And this is kind of why we're focusing on this webinar today because, you know, we, we've got a lot of customers um, that have not a lot of experience on the surface milling side. Um, not because they don't choose not to, but um, because when they had feature cam back on the Dell cam days, um, that's might that might be all they really needed. And over the last three or four years, uh, Autodesk has kind of opened up the, the reins as to what feature cam can provide that customer. So if you had something like um, a certain type of translator, well, Autodesk may have decided to upgrade you to the next level of say feature cam or power mill. So you might've had access to surface milling this entire time and just chose not to look at it or maybe because you don't know how to use it, you kind of stray away from it and maybe use a different cam system or you don't even quote on that type of work. So we're gonna go ahead and just take a, a look at some surface milling here today. We're gonna stay on the roughing side for today and then we'll jump venture into the like semi finish and finishing on Friday. But what we're gonna do is kind of focus on just on the roughing, kind of give you guys uh, different types of roughing. You know, there's multiple options in there and there's some of these check boxes, what, what do they do? What do they provide you? Okay, so if you weren't aware of this, um, Power Mill and Feature Cam kind of share the same algorithms when it comes to the surface milling side. Uh, more so on Feature Cam than Power Mill. I mean, 
feature cam uses power mills uh, kernel to um, calculate the surface milling tool pass that has access to you. So if you're a feature cam user or a power mill user, they cross integrate with each other pretty easily. So it makes going from one software to the next uh, pretty seamless. The pages are different. The options are kind of scattered in different locations. Uh, the terminology might be a little bit different, but all in all, it's, it's the same kernel that kind of crunches those tool paths behind the scenes. Okay, so when we go into um, the surface milling side, when we're picking a strategy, we're gonna be met with this page. And again, we're gonna focus on the roughing strategies today. Uh, there's three different types of dedicated roughing strategies, uh, Z-level, plunge, and parallel. So what do these provide? 99% of the time, you're probably gonna stay with the Z-level. Z-level is like a slicing type motion. So if you think of the model when you bring it into feature cam, uh, when you crunch a Z-level type strategy, um, it slices the model in Z increments. That's the best way I can explain it. So it's almost like a bread slicer. You put the bread, the bread into the bread slicer, it's gonna slice it in those increments and it's gonna place the tool path at those increments against the model. And there's four different, uh, tip, different types of uh, slicing options. Uh, your standard offset spiral, continuous spiral, zigzag and vortex. So we'll briefly talk about which one does what, um, but we'll probably focus on one for the rest of the demonstration today. Um, plunge milling. Uh, plunge milling, uh, when I first started out into the uh, the tool mold trade, we used to get a lot of programmings from an offline source and they used to use plunge milling. Um, and let me tell you, it was a, a pretty scary tool path to run sometimes. So, um, but it has its uses. There's still options there to use plunge milling. Um, if you kind of read through the verbiage there, it's an archaic type roughing strategy that relies on the actual Z motion of the machine. So think of it as you're drilling away stock with a, non, not a drill, but like a plunge cutter. So it's still a viable option for those older machines that just can't deal with uh, radial forces. And then we also have parallel. So you're gonna notice on this little image here, we've got parallel and the roughing and we also have parallel in the finishing it's it to me it's the identical strategy except when you grab it from the roughing side you're just leaving extra stock that's pretty much it but a lot of people will use roughing uh sort of parallel and a roughing if they've got a really easy to machine part um and they just want to get as close as they can to the model and kind of follow that curvature of the model All right, so kind of jumping to the next slide here, Z-level offset. So if you're wondering what a Z-level offset spiral type toolpath looks like from a bird's eye view, this is pretty much it. So again, it slices the model at that Z increment. Um, it offsets, single offsets till it goes towards the center of the part or from the center to the outside of the part. And then we have uh, these transitions that get me from one offset to the next. So in this case, it's a a direct transition, but we also have like a high speed option, which would be more like an arc fit. Continuous spiral. So it's basically the same as the offset we just looked at, except it starts again, either on the outside or the inside, depending on how we've got it set up. And it's, it's gonna continue to work its way towards um, the center of the outside in a continuous fashion. So it's just going to eliminate a lot of those transitions. So it's just supposed to uh, give you uh, almost like a, a direct tool load uh, at most of the time, okay? Zigzag. So just think of linear passes back and forth. It's the same as the parallel tool path we were just kind of looking at um, in the X or Y direction, but we can also choose a, an angle in between. So if I want to rough at 45 degrees or 60 degrees, I could place that uh, that value in there. Um, I usually will use zigzag uh, for an easy to machine type material. So if I'm cutting say graphite or maybe I'm cutting uh, aluminum or bronze, say, um, zigzag is a, a pretty good strategy for that. But when we get into the more difficult to machine material, uh, I'll kind of stray away from zigzag. And last but not least, we have vortex. So if any of you on this call have not looked into uh, adaptive type 
roughing. Um, Vortex is that adaptive type roughing, which allows you to take a, a deeper depth of cut, a smaller radial depth of cut, so a side cut, and it allows you to keep consistent feeds on that tool. And why is that important? Because most people buy an end mill, and if they use it in a roughing type application, they might take a lower depth of cut. You know, say if I have a half inch end mill, I might take a 50 or 30 thou depth of cut. Uh, I might run that unintended for a few hours, and when I come back, that tool may be missing. And that's because you're consistently putting the tool load at the tip of the tool, and you're putting all the heat at the tip of the tool. So what happens is anytime there's like a directional type change, um, think of it as I'm bending a piece of metal back and forth in my hand. Well, what's gonna happen when I bend that thing back and forth a bunch of times? Well, it's gonna snap. And the end mill's gonna work in the same fashion. So if I keep pushing on that tip of the tool and releasing that load on the tip of the tool, um, eventually that, that tool's gonna fail. So Vortex alleviates that by keeping the load consistent. It allows you to go higher feed rates, deeper depth of cut, um, and any type there's uh, an exceed on the engagement angle. So if you look in these corners, you're going to be uh, met with almost like a trochordial type movement, which uh, again is better for the tool life. So my uh, counterpart, Louis Martineau, did a webinar last week on adaptive roughing. Um, hopefully that's uploaded to our YouTube channel. I highly recommend he did it more on the HSM side or Fusion 360, but the theory still, you can still carry that theory over into Power Mill or Feature Cam. All right, so at this point in time, we're going to jump into Feature Cam again, uh, take a look at bringing in a surface mill part or a three dimensional type part. Okay, so let's go to my desktop. And I'm going to drag and drop this file in into a milling document. And I work with inches, so I'm going to leave it in inches. And again, we're going to be met with that import results wizard. And I mean, right now I can see my z-axis is pointing up to the right orientation. If I look at this from a top view, I'm pretty confident that my z vector is facing my line of draw my part but for me i always just go through the motions here of this import result wizard so i'm going to define by two points like so you can see the z-axis uh, has not moved but in case it's slightly out uh, i may have corrected it define two points from my x same thing as what i just did for my z-axis it probably is in the right orientation but just in case. So I'm gonna choose a block. I'm gonna add quarter inch to the top of my block. And in this application, I'm just gonna pretend that this block was already squared to size on the outside and the bottom. And we're just gonna remove the material off the top and in the two part locations. And I'm gonna put my pickup in the lower left-hand side but maybe I want it on the top of my part. So let's pick the Z and let's move it down in the Z only down to that location. And for this application, we're not going to venture into any multi-axis. So we'll leave this on no and we'll hit finish. And just to make my machining setup here a little bit more applicable to what could be on my machine center, um, I'm gonna jump into my add-ins here. Uh, there's this vice import add-in. If you haven't seen it before, I can explain a little bit further. If you have any questions, feel free again to ask the question on the fly. I'll do my best to answer it. Um, what I'm going to do is just pick a vice here. So maybe this Kurt vice. This is not a vice that's in the standard add-in. It's something that I added in for a customer. Um, so it's a very customizable add-in. I can add my own custom vices in here. So if you don't see the vice that you use, um, I feel free to ask me how it's done. So part amount held in the vise, I'm not gonna use parallels, but if I had parallels, I could add parallels. I'm just gonna place it in half an inch and import. And for those of you that are PowerMill and FeatureCam users, um, this vise import can be used in both PowerMill and FeatureCam. Okay, 
So carry on. Um, again, these fillets here potentially could have already been cut from maybe a, a different setup. So what we're going to do is pick this bottom face. I'm going to go into the Construct tab, and I'm going to use this trimmed edge to extract that outside curve, like so. And we're going to go into our stock properties. Underneath stock curve, I'm going to use that curve to uh, give it a more defined shape, but keep the stock on top. So think of that as, like a, as a custom type shape. <laughs> okay, so we've got our part in the vise set up, we're ready to go. Um, now, since we're doing surface milling, first things first, I need to select what surfaces I'm going to machine. So when you go into, say, the Home tab and you construct a new feature, if you've only been working from dimension or from curve, surface milling is down here by itself. I'm going to go ahead and select surface milling and hit next. And then now it's a matter of me of defining what surfaces I want to add into this uh, feature. So whenever I'm roughing, and a lot of times even in finishing, I'll just select the entire part. I'm just going to bring the entire part in because if I miss any surfaces, um, that could tend to be a little bit fatal because uh, feature cam may gouge through the parts or the surfaces that we omitted. So I'd rather grab more than what I need than not enough. So I'm going to hold my space bar down, left click on the part, it's in my vise. This just saves me time from selecting each individual surface. If I hold the shift down and then select the solid, it's going to select the entire solid for me. Let's add that into the window. And there's a couple different methods here we could utilize when we do roughing or even finishing for that matter. If I wanted to, I can choose, I can kind of build a feature. So on this part, maybe I wanted to do a rough, a semi-finish and a finishing operational one. Maybe it's a simple, simple part. Um, I can choose the first method. I generally always pick a single operation. My parts aren't usually that simple. And now we're met with that new strategy selector that I showed you in the previous slide. So I'm gonna go ahead and select Z level. Uh, we're not gonna do example of plunging, uh, maybe parallel, but in this point in time, I'm gonna use Z level, like I said, it's probably gonna be your 99% go-to when it comes to roughing with surface milling. And then it's up to us here to kind of remember the, the offsets that I showed you in the previous slides in the PowerPoint, um, which type of roughing um, option do I want? So I'm gonna keep it simple and use the offset spiral. Uh, then we have the option here for either a pocket or a boss. So we'll leave this as it is for now and I'll kind of show you what this could do for us. It's going to automatically choose the best appropriate tool. That might not be the tool we wanna to use. So let's go ahead and search for a new tool. I might wanna use a bullnose tool and maybe a half inch diameter. Actually, let's delete that. Mm, let's go anything interesting and no. Got a couple tools missing here that I was expecting to be here. Uh, not the end of the world. Okay, I'll just grab this half inch end mill, uh, the regular one here, and let's go ahead and hit finish. And I'm gonna go into the tool itself and I'm just going to add Let's verify if it's in here or not. Oops. A little trigger happy there. Uh, okay, so we got a half inch, 0.5. Let's change that to bullnose. Yeah, it seems to be missing. Okay, no worries. I'm just going to go ahead and add a one mil radius here. Uh, the shank diameter is going to be the same, so half an inch. Let's apply that. Okay, that looks good. I'll just leave it as is. And maybe I'll just call this one half inch tip rad one mil, just so I know what it is. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and just do a quick preview.
Okay, so we can see uh, when we rough out this part, we've got uh, our, our first slice on the top, which removes majority of the excess amount of stock on the Z portion of my part. And then as it gets into each uh, U-shaped part, uh, we got the tool kind of plunging outside. Okay, that's because when we're in the operation, of, in the Z-level operation, we can choose how we want to classify uh, the slices. Are they a uh, pocket style or a boss style? Now, if we have it in, in this instance, if we have it set as a boss, it's going to do its best to plunge outside and work its way in. If we choose it to be a pocket, it's going to do its best to work from the inside out. So you're going to see more ramp moves into the stock than we would as it was set to uh, a boss. So no right or wrong here, it's just kind of how feature cam is thinking. So I'm gonna leave it as a 3D boss and apply, because I like uh, plunging on the outside. And for those of you who have not seen feature cam before, uh, the depth of cut by default is set in our machining attributes. So this is something that uh, is kind of unique when it comes to cam. Um, we can kind of teach the software how we want feature cam to pull certain machining uh, options in for us. So if you're not aware of that, you go into features manufacturing. If I go into machining attributes, and if I go into milling, sorry, step over, well, right now, the depth of cut is set to 50% uh, of our tool diameter by default. Surface milling. Um, it's kind of the same thing. We've got a lot of surface milling attributes in here too. So uh, finish allowance, 50 thousandths. Tolerance is already pre-established, already set. So if you want to change any of these options, you can. Uh, and if you want to save them for maybe the next time you uh, create a FM document or a feature cam file, you could save this as a configuration. So remember this or retain that information. Whereas a machining can, um, attributes, only changes these for this FM document. Okay, so if I wanted to change the depth of cut, uh, there's different methods I could do. I could change it within the tool properties. So I could have the tool remember the step over the radial cut and the axial depth of cut, the Z depth. I could place those values into the tool and store those and save those. Or I can actually go into the rough operation underneath milling and I could change that value in here somewhere. So when you're in the surface milling properties tab, right? When you go into the rough, um, there's different pages here of options. So we've kind of already looked at the tool page, uh, feeds and speeds. These are the speeds and feeds that I'm using at this point in time. I can override them with my new speeds and feeds, or again, um, if you're new to feature cam, the way that feeds and speeds are calculated are based off material. So if I go into the stock, we're defining this block as aluminum at this point in time. I could change it to a different material. And that's how the initial speeds and feeds are calculated based off uh, speeds and feeds that are placed into the material. Or I can change it within the tool or I can just override them. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, let's look at this roughing up or operation again once again coolant commands or coolant options uh, this is based off my post so i have a Haas vf post um, your post might have different options in here uh, we'll skip over post variables uh, let's jump into the milling tab which these items that we change or or add value soon here will dictate uh, a new shape to our our uh, surface milling uh, roughing operation and then we have leads on different ways that we want to enter the stock or maybe move around outside of the stock. So right now the uh, ramping to depth is turned on by default at a five degree uh, angle. If I want to change it to a helical, uh, there's the checkbox. And you can see we've got approaches from outside where possible. So since we've defined this as a boss, it's plunging on the outside, outside of the stock and working its way into the material. Okay, so if I wanted to change the increment to say maybe an eighth of an inch, I'm cutting aluminum with this half inch end mill, I can take an eighth of an inch depth of cut with this tool. 
I'm gonna go ahead and override it and hit set and apply. Let's exit out. Let's do a 3D sim, which will show me any type of gouges or any type of collisions. Okay, so it's working its way from the outside in. Okay, a couple things to uh, kind of keep tabs on here. First of all, uh, these large staircases. Okay, so that's, that's number one. Um, and then we also have, sorry about the graphics here. We also have this pocket in the inside of my part, okay? Do I want a rough inside this pocket? Well, that depends on my tool. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump back into the, uh, the PowerPoint real quick. And just a couple other things to kind of keep tabs on when we're using surface milling or the control that you have on the surface milling side for that, mat, for that fact. So if you've uh, been inside a surface milling before, especially in the roughing side, there's some check boxes and there's some options that we have available that you may or may not have looked at. One is step cutting. So what is step cutting? Well, step cutting allows us to take maybe a larger depth of cut. Uh, maybe we're doing vortex and we're able to take that two times diameter depth of cut. Or again, we just got this uh, half inch end mill that I'm able to take an eighth of an inch depth of cut. But what this does is it leaves a lot of staircasing against the, uh, the walls or even the depths of my part. Because the way that, again, this algorithm works is it slices the model in Z increment. So as we get more towards down towards the shallower portions of the model, we could be leaving more, more stock. Okay, so step cutting allows us to remachine. So think of this as a kind of like a hybrid type tool path where it's gonna cut one and then it's gonna remachine back up towards the top or the last previous uh, slice. So example of that, um, if I ran that 3D sim again, we, we can see those large staircases. If I jump back into the properties here, C level, remachining, step cutting. So I know it took uh, an eighth of an inch depth of cut. Maybe I want to take three or four incremental steps up back towards my previous slice. So I'm just going to do the math in my head. 31 and uh, a little bit thousands of an inch uh, Z step up. Hit OK. And now when we run the 3D sim, Takes a few seconds here to recalculate since we're adding information to the, the tool path. Okay, but more so when we get more towards the periphery or the uh, sides of my, my, uh, my part here. If I slow this down, let's pause that. I'll just run it single step. So as it finishes up that, that depth here, uh, what feature cam is going to do is step back up and cut back up towards the top. Okay, hopefully that uh, made a little bit more sense to you. Let's go ahead and carry that simulation forward. Any questions as that's running through, feel free to, again, interrupt me or add them through the chat there. Okay, so you can see the basically the usefulness of step cutting because, uh, again, we don't have to recalculate another strategy or another toolpath. It's gonna take care of us all in one shot. One thing that we also might wanna consider is this pocket. So I've defined this tool as an end mill, but what if it was not a center cutting type tool, like an indexable tool? The, this could be very dangerous. So when we go back to this PowerPoint here, uh, this image here will kind of show you the 
types of danger we can get into because we could get a lot of buildup in that pocket. It's not going to show it in feature cam because unfortunately feature cam is not smart enough to give us that information or that feedback. But I'm sure we've all been in that that situation where we throw a tool down inside of an area that's a little bit too small for that tool to clear the stock out. So I've got names for it. Um, carrot buildup, uh, the volcano effect, you know, we've all seen it. We've got the tool just basically burning up on itself because it can't, can't clear the chips out or it's just building up on the non-cutting portion of the tool. So how do we control this? Well, let's go back into the feature, the surface mill feature, let's go back into properties. And this area removal, think of this as a filter. I can, I'm, I'm able to add a filter to tell feature cam that I don't want my tool to go into specific areas that are not enough for that tool to clear out that material. So we call this area removal. Uh, if you're a power mill user, you may have used that before. That's a, uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but um, it's basically the same, the same type of control. So the threshold value is 95% of the diameter of the tool. So the way you can figure out this is you can take the non-cutting portion of the tool. Okay, so uh, this document doesn't really show it that well, but if you take the non-cutting portion of the tool and divide it by the cutting portion of the tool, the, the major diameter of the tool, you divide that and you should get the ratio of the utmost value you can place in there. So the, the larger I bring this back towards one, the more filter I'm going to place on that toolpath. So even if I bring it over one, so like if I were to put uh, 110%, well, I'm going to filter 10% more than the minimum value. The closer I bring this down to zero, the more I'm forcing that tool to maybe go into areas that uh, it shouldn't. Hope I explained that correctly. So let's go ahead and hit apply. Hit OK. 95% is probably the, uh, it's an over safe factor. So I usually just leave it. So for instance, this uh, tool's got a 40 thou tip radius. So if we were to take 40 per side off that half inch, uh, if we took 420 divided by half an inch, that would give us that value. So off the top of my head, I know what that is. I'm going to calculate it real quick on my, on my phone. So 420 divided by 0.5 would be uh, roughly 85%. Okay, so as it gets down towards the bottom portion of that, the model, uh, we should stay out of that pocket, which it looks like it has abided by that rule. Okay. So that looks good. So uh, what I might do if I'm pretty satisfied or happy with what we have at this point in time, um, I'm going to go ahead and just save the results, starting point. Um, all that does is allow me to run subsequent 3D sims and carry on from that location. So let's jump into the feature properties once again. Let's go into the milling tab um, just to kind of verbalize some of the options that we have here. Working my way from the bottom to the top. Z start, Z end. I can limit my toolpath within specific regions of my Z axis. So the start of my toolpath and the end of my toolpath. Total stock. Um, so for instance, if I was cutting a, um, maybe a forged die and I have a half inch of stock on these walls, I could put uh, that value in there instead of starting from, you know, a solid block or a solid billet. Toolpath corner. So we'll kind of touch on these individually here for a second. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the top, but I'm going to end at the top of my part. Let's just do a quick, let's eject that. Let's do a quick centerline sim so we can kind of visualize this. Okay. So if we were to zoom into these transitions from maybe the X move to the Y move, right now we've got these sharp directional changes. I really want to eliminate those as much as possible. Uh, it's not a good situation on the machine. So let's go ahead and eject this. Let's go back into the properties. Let's go back into the milling tab. And in the corner radius percentage here, what I could do is put a percentage of the tool in force an arc on those transition moves. 
So now when we do a preview of that, we should see some nice arcing there. Oop. Maybe I changed the wrong one, my apologies. Let's unset that, we'll talk about that one in a second. Toolpath corner clearance, okay. Set, apply, preview. There we go, okay. So as it transitions again from that X, Y move, uh, we're gonna force an arc in, in here. Even though it's not against the model, uh, it's still to me important to drive those arcs there. It's gonna be a lot easier on the machine um, when it gets into those hard corners, uh, it's not gonna be as hard or jerky on the machine. We also have the option of fitting arcs against the model. So if we were to look at say, this tool pass segment here, if I were to eject this and add in the value here that I originally added, so maybe 5% of the tool against the, the corners there against the model, uh, we can smooth those out which again is going to eliminate chatter against the part, which could cause issues uh, when we get into finishing where you know I, that chatter might have caused uh, some deflection into the part, which might cause some gouges. So we can also uh, have control on that as well. So we can see these nice arc moves. Okay, so hopefully that uh, explanation was okay. Let's go ahead and unset the Z depth bring this back to where it was. And I'm gonna have to run the 3D sim to update that, but uh, we'll continue on talking about this first. Toolpath tolerance, again, uh, FutureCam uses the 5,000 tolerance there. By default, I can change it into the configuration or attributes if I want this to be a little bit tighter. Um, there's no right or wrong tolerance value. I often asked that in a, in a training class. You know, it's, it's all based on certain, certain variables on the machine. Um, the setup, the rigidity of the setup. So I can't really say that you should always use a certain value here. This is why this is always um, an interesting topic to say the least. I would say uh, we don't want this too tight in a roughing application because uh, we're gonna add more point data, which could kind of bog down the machine depending. So we'll just leave this on the default tolerance of five thousandths. Um, we're gonna jump over the horsepower, um, step over radius distance. Um, it just uh, gives me a threshold or a filter that I can apply uh, a rapid distance to. Um, rough step over. So as we're clearing the material away, every time it moves into the separate, the next offset, it's gonna be 33.3% of the tool. So I could change that to be a, a slightly smaller or larger step over, depending on what I'm doing. Um, maximum ramp distance, I can change this value to eliminate, um, as it's ramping into the material, I can eliminate, the, or I can control the depth or the distance of that ramp move. More importantly though, I mean, we won't go through an example right now, but holder clipping. So there's a, a nice little feature in here where, you know, the best way I can describe this is if I was cutting into a pocket or a region where maybe the tool is only a three inch overhang uh, in my holder, but the pocket is four inches deep. Well, I could incorporate holder clipping, which feature cam will recognize when that holder gets close to the model, it's gonna continue to push the toolpath segments inwards to avoid that holder collision. So it's a pretty nice little feature here. Uh, all I need to really do is turn on this to true hit set, turn this on to true, hit set, machine maximum stock. So if I leave this on false, what feature can do is actually trim those areas away. If I leave this on true, the segments will stay continuous. Now, th the one thing here that you have to keep in mind though is when you turn these on true, make sure you hit apply. Once you hit apply, you're gonna get some other options here with regards to holder clearance. So holder clearance, and you're gonna have shank clearance down here as well. So the default values are 50 and 100. Um, these can obviously be changed. So I'm gonna just unset these. Uh, it's something that I highly recommend you at least evaluate and look into. Finish allowance. Um, this is how much stock actually and radially I'm leaving against the model. If I wanted to have separate axial and radial values, um, I can change the axial 
allowance here, and this would change to a more radial approach. So think of wall stock and floor stock. So I'm gonna leave this on 50. And let's go ahead and just re, actually before we jump out of here, what I wouldn't mind talking about is uh, flat support. This is always a question that kind of jumps up in the training as well. So feature cam, the way that um, it slices the model, when it gets into a region where there's flats, it's going to make sure it leaves whatever amount of stock that we've asked it to onto these flats. So if you were to turn this off, feature cam is going to start at the top of the stock, slice its way in those Z increments, and we don't have control as to how much stock's being left on this flat. So I highly recommend that you leave it on either level or area. Um, area is going to give you a little bit more machining time, but level is going to make sure that it leaves whatever we're asking it to on the actual stock on these flat areas. Direction, so if I want to go from um, unidirectional or bidirectional, retract and plunge options, and more importantly, uh, when we get into point control, if I have an older machine that doesn't like points, it'd rather use GO2 or GO3 moves, um, I could place um, arc fitting in here instead. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that 3D sim once again. Yeah, it's just going to update a little bit slightly because of the radiuses, but uh, I'll leave it the way it is. Okay. All right. So on to the next strategy, because if I were to go and run that 3D sim again, we haven't touched on this pocket. And I've got some tighter areas in here that I want to remove material, and I don't want FutureCam to remove all the material like we just did with that half inch. So let's rename this as a uh, main rough. And let's go back in here with a smaller tool. So I'm gonna repeat the same process as to selecting my model. Again, holding the shift button down, selecting that model, going to features, surface milling, single operation. I'm gonna go back into Z level. Let's uh, leave everything we see here again as the way it was from before. Um, let's go ahead and hit next. Let's select a new tool. So let's go ahead and look for a quarter inch. Let's use this one. I will use this one. I'm just going to double click on it. I'm going to add a tip radius. So let's go 0.2, sorry, 20 thousandths. Apply. And I'm gonna change this to quarter inch TR for tip radius and uh, half mil. Hit okay, let's create a new tool. Okay, so let's go ahead and just finish that. And if I were to hit preview right now, I would just get the machine just like we just did before because there's no detection as to where we went before. So this is where a stock model could be very, very useful because FutureCam has some decent stock model management on the surface milling side. So to create a stock model, uh, it's something a little bit more of a manual process, but you may or may not have seen stock models here in the part view. I'm just gonna right click, add a stock model. And I'm gonna place a name of the stock model. Maybe I just wanna call it stock. The step size and the tolerance, um, since it's not a physical solid model, um, a stock model is an STL or a mesh file. So it's basically the openings of these meshes. If I were to look at it from the top view, it's like little cubes of material is how big are those little cubes of material. So the default value is 50. I'm going to leave it on that. If I'm going smaller than a 50,000 diameter tool, I might want to consider uh, tightening this up. The tolerance, I normally leave this on the same tolerance as my roughing, just to kind of keep it one-to-one. -one. The operation result, um, what am I referring to? So I'm gonna to refer to that previous toolpath. 
hit OK. And most people get to this point and don't know what the next the next step is. So what we need to do is compute that stock model. So stock model is almost like a toolpath. It still needs to be it still needs to uh, be treated like a toolpath because if I update this this toolpath here, I'm going to have to re-update the stock model. So just expand it, right click, uh, recompute. And again, um, most users are like, well, what happened? Well, if you just put your cursor over the stock, you're going to see that mesh file. And if you click it once, um, it'll kind of stay on the screen for a little bit. So this is what feature cam is going to use now on the next toolpath strategy. It's going to refer to this physical stock model to basically figure out where the remaining stock is. So if I just click out in the graphics, um, I'm just going to hide that stock model because it's not very pleasant on the eyes. So let's go back into surface mill, go back into properties. I'm going to go into stock because in strategy, nowhere in here that it's looking for a physical stock model. So I'm going to go into stock, select the stock model, and I want to refer to this point in time. Apply, hit OK. Uh, actually, let's jump into that real quick. One thing I'm going to change is the Z increments, uh, quarter inch diameter tool. Maybe I can take 40 thousandths with it. Hit apply, hit OK. And now when I run my 3D sim, I should see it focus only on the areas where the remaining stock is, most likely in these radiuses and more importantly inside this pocket. Oh, let's uh, shut this guy off. There we go. Hit play. As you can see, it focused on these corners, for the most part, focus on this region, that pocket. I know that's pretty quick. Let me just slow that down. Okay, so it's working its way down towards the center. It's gonna move all that stock in the trench as well. Okay, let's go ahead and use that as a starting point. Let's eject this real quick. And I'm gonna call this uh, re rest machine. And let's go ahead and just look at one more strategy. And whenever we were roughing old parts at the place that, we, that I used to work at, when we were sending it out maybe for heat treat, what we would do is always run a ball nose tool over the part just to make sure that um, there was no surprises anywhere. So I'm gonna go ahead and again, select that solid once again, go back into features and surface milling, single operation. We're gonna do a parallel roughing operation, X parallel. So we'll dive into this a little bit more on Friday as to what these represent. I'm gonna leave it on X parallel so the, the slices are gonna go in the X direction. I'm just going to go ahead and hit finish. I'm going to grab a 3 8 ball nose because I already went in with a quarter inch flat. I could go in with a quarter inch ball nose tool, but I'm going to upsize it to the next level and stay in between the half inch and the, the quarter inch. So I'm going to use that 3 8 ball. Okay, uh, let's go into the milling tab. The step overs are 33%. Uh, maybe I changed this to 10%, which would be 50,000 step over. Let's hit apply, let's do a preview. Okay, so there's a couple things here that I don't like. Uh, first off are these three flats on the top of the part. Uh, it's a lot of excess amount of material. And also I might not wanna send that tool down inside that pocket. So let's go ahead and eject this real quick. Let's jump into our dimensions tab. And what we could do is place some check surfaces in. So I don't want feature cam to touch these three surfaces. 
So I'm going to go into the part surfaces first, and I'm just going to kind of scroll down until I find these flats. Sometimes it's it could be a little bit cumbersome to find out which surfaces those are faces. There we go. There's one, 236, and let's just kind of continue on here, find the next one. Okay, 246. So I'm going to remove those from a machinable surface, and I'm going to add them to a non-machinable surface. So basically, I'm going to stay away from those. And before I hit apply, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct a new surface to stay out of this region. So there's a few different ways that we can attack this. The easiest way is I'm going to jump into the Construct tab. I'm going to explode that face off of the solid, selected face only. That's going to create for me surface number one. And I'm going to take this surface. I'm going to jump into the surface option in the construct tab, and I'm going to untrim that surface. And there's again, there's multiple ways I can untrim the surface. I'm just going to hit untrim all. Just do a quick preview. Looks good. So now I've basically created this uh, nice surface that kind of flows over top. And we're going to jump back into this surface mill. And I'm going to add it into one of my machinable um, surfaces. Show all. Surface one. Hit OK. Let's go ahead and run a 3D sim. Okay, so uh, just to get all that stuff out of the bottom, uh, get it closer to the net size. Again, we're gonna send this to heat treat. Most of the stock's out of the corner, so I shouldn't get any bite with this tool. And then when uh, it comes back for finishing, it's gonna be much easier for me to, uh, to kind of get going. Okay, so that's kind of uh, a nice little process here. Um, I could have brought that closer to net, maybe bring it to 30 thousandths, but I just left it on the default of 50. So I'm going to stop this portion of the uh, webinar here. That's basically all that I've got prepared or planned for today. If there are any questions, I will hang out here for a bit. Um, but other than that, I uh, appreciate you guys all coming out. Uh, we'll be back here on Friday, uh, same time, another hour. We'll just touch on some finishing. Um, but hopefully uh, there was some stuff to be learned here today. But again, I'll, I'll hang out here until... Uh, Everyone's off. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask away. Thank you.